everybody, this is Emmy with the Graveyard Shift Talk Show, and here we are, smack dab, in the beginning of Season 9, and already we're hitting it out of the ballpark with another home run author interview, this time with author Terrence A. Harkin, and we're, gonna, we're talking to him about his book called The Big Buddha Bicycle Race, and I dare you to say that ten times fast. <laughs> Just a little bit yeah. about Terrence before we introduce him and about the book. Um, so the book itself is a novel, and it basically brings you into upcountry Thailand and war-ravaged Laos late in the Vietnam War. And, you know, at one point, it's a cross-cultural wartime love story. It's also... Uh, a surreal remembrance of two groups who have been basically erased from American history. You've got the brash active duty soldiers who risked prison by taking part in the GI anti-war movement and the gung-ho gutsy air commandos who risked death night after night flying out over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that's just, that just really scratches the surface of it. And really, Terrence himself is multi-leveled. I mean, he's, he got a B.A. in English American Literature from Brown University while spending weekends touring New England with bands that opened for the Yardbirds, Shirelles, Critters, and, hello, Jimi Hendrix. His play Resurrection, produced during his senior year, was a winner of the Production Workshop Playwriting Contest. And in the U.S. Uh, Air Force, which, by the way, Terrence, thank you so much for your service, sir. Uh, despite editing and writing for two underground GI newspapers, he was asked to write the 1971 history of Debt 3, 601st photo flight. He won a CBS fellowship for his screenwriting while completing an MFA at the University of Southern California and went on to spend 25 years as a Hollywood cameraman. And just so you understand how talented this guy is, uh, his credits include The Goodbye Girl, Legend of Billie Jean, Quincy, Designing Women, Hello, Seinfeld, Tracy Ullman, MASH, and From Here to Eternity. Terrence, hell of an honor to have you on the show, sir. How are you doing today? I'm really uh, just thrilled to be here, Emilio. It's great to be talking to you in person. Well, that's wonderful. You know, I just wanted to let everybody know, and by the way, I, I, I feel great, very happy talking with you. And it, it was a shame. You know, we really wanted to do this in a video interview, but, you know, sometimes as much as we are uh, immersed in technology, sometimes technology does not want to be immersed in us. And, uh, but it's okay. We're going to make this work, and, I, you know, I, I, I think it's great. You know, Terrence, you have an, one hell of an impressive resume. And by the way, Congratulations for being nominated for the 2017 Kirkus Prize in Literature. That's quite an achievement in itself. Yeah, that's, uh, I didn't realize what a big deal that was because I've been overseas the last few years. But uh, as I've traveled back in the States, uh, especially among, I've got several friends who are librarians, and they just tell me uh, it's, it's really a... a it's really got a tremendous reputation among uh, among librarians who buy a lot of books and the publishing industry itself. So uh, I've become a little more thrilled as time has gone on to have, have gotten nominated, and who knows? Uh, I'll find out in November. Well, that's great. Well, What's please let, make, make sure you update us and let us know. We'll be very uh, interested to hear the results, no matter what they are. I mean, still, being nominated in itself is quite a prestigious uh, honor in itself. So, but today we're here to talk about your novel, Big Buddha Bicycle Race. Now, um, this novel is fiction, but I, I, it's based in reality, correct? I mean, can, can you tell us, a, can you give us a little overview of this novel, and, and what brought you to write it? Sure. Uh, at the heart of the novel was, was my experience with the photo squadron in Ubon, Thailand, a year before the story set, and I just happened to be there during a lull. And right before I got there, the base had been attacked. One of our planes crash landed and lost some of the crew members. And then I was there for a year where things were relatively going well from our point of view. But what I saw, uh, editing combat documentation footage for the first half of the year, I, saw, I just saw. Uh, amazing devastation all over Southeast Asia from our fighter bombers that people in the States would never see. I mean, they, they were seeing a lot of the perspective of infantrymen, which was pretty incredible in itself. But this was on a scale, this is a scale of World War II. 
And, uh, and then the second half of the year, we were heavily involved with night operations on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I might have seen uh, as many as 10,000 trucks destroyed in convoys coming down the trail. And not only did nobody in the Air Force know about it, I mean, nobody in the States knew about it, but nobody in the Air Force knew about it because this was uh, was kind of a top-secret operation. It was in violation of the Geneva Accords, but the North Vietnamese were also in violation of the Geneva Accords, and they were sending supplies into South Vietnam, and we were uh, trying to stop it, trying to protect the infantrymen on the ground there. So it was this I was exposed to a tremendous amount of warfare, and nobody in the states knew about it. And I just, it just kind of stuck with me that uh, this was a this was a story that needed to be told. And and then the fiction part of it is I I kind of just took a perspective of what if what if I'd been there a year later, and what if I'd been uh, the year I I left uh, four or fifteen planes, these uh, modified cargo planes that were flying over the Ho Chi Minh Trail were shot down with about 15 people apiece on each one, and, and uh, a few people survived. So I kind of asked the question, you know, what if I had been one of these planes? What if I had been one of these couple of guys who survived? And, and uh, from that, I could I just develop a lot of material. Wow. Then the love stories were just, that was stuff I was just seeing going on around me. There were a lot of young Americans uh, meeting these beautiful exotic Thai women in this beautiful exotic culture and and that was a whole story in itself so I tried to weave those two storylines together so basically and just again I mean this is you know normally when you when you hear about stuff like this you expect nonfiction. you expect like almost a bio not necessarily biography but almost a um like a journal type of thing but you really you took this and you it sounds like you decided to tell it from a somewhat fictionalized point of view, is that correct? Yeah, it's it's definitely fiction, but I went on to, you know, like you were saying before, I went on to spend 25 years as a cameraman in Hollywood, so I could also write pretty authentically about being a cameraman on these planes. And uh, some of the poetic license I took was, by the time... All this heavy action in 1972 was happening. We didn't actually have camera on the planes anymore, but they had been on the planes right up until that year. So I just took a little, took a little license with time, squeezed it together, and and and, and just made a much more compelling story by having someone there to bear witness to what was going on and and kind of bear witness as a cameraman. He could be seeing what was going on on the ground at the same time, being kind of amazed at how. Uh, Competent and, and uh, courageous these crews were that were flying on these planes with basically flying blind at night. They had some instrumentation, but the uh, the gunners were so well trained they could load you know they could load a Gatling gun blindfolded. Wow! And they pretty much did. That's unreal. And and how exactly did you? Um, I mean, of course, we all it's obvious to know how you would write it because I mean, being involved uh, in in you know, in Hollywood and all that stuff, you know, you would al- already know pretty much how to write, but how, how exactly did you get from having this idea in your head, putting it on p- in paper, and then, uh, like, who, did you, did you approach a publisher with this, or did you publish this yourself? How did, how did the book actually become uh, reality? We well, you know, how it even became a book is interesting, because uh, the, I, the germ of the idea started out during a rainy season out in Ubon, and we were stuck in the editorial trailer, and I had a, a boss there who was a real, kind of a real jokester, and we heard this announcement on the Air Force radio about uh, a field trip out to the Big Buddha, and uh, he got kidding around about, you know, we should just hire on taxi cabs and gone out, and by the time we got tossing it around, we were saying, oh, we, everybody on base had a bike back then, and everybody in town had a bike, so we just got finally joking around about how we should organize a bicycle race. And we never quite did that, but it was so close to being done. It was it was easily possible. That, that kind of stuck with me. And then I got to film school, and I wrote a movie treatment with basically the bare bones outline of the story. And uh, I had a professor 
who had been in the OSI, which is the forerunner of the CIA in Southeast Asia during World War II, and he um, very wisely suggested I come back to Southeast Asia and do more research and develop my Asian characters and kind of d develop the uh, Thai culture and Buddhist culture that was kind of just touched out in the movie treatment. And that was great advice. And, and so I had kind of a rough screenplay, and I was starting to work as a cameraman. I had an actor friend who got me to one of the best agents in Hollywood in the late 70s, and this top Hollywood agent assured me that no one would ever make a movie about the Vietnam War. It was just poison. <laughs> and so I went, I went back to work as a cameraman, and meanwhile I'm watching Apocalypse Now and, and, and Mash. Full Metal Jacket and <laughs> you know several very deer hunter, very uh, compelling movies come out. Yeah. But even there, what haunted me was it was always from an American perspective. And to this day, even something, a, a book as good as Matterhorn was, by being about infantrymen, was about an American perspective and the, the enemy were just these dark shadows in the jungle. And just by the, the dumb luck of being stationed in Thailand and being around a whole vibrant Asian culture, but then also knowing there was a communist insurgency going on in this country, it just gave me a chance to really explore the, all all kinds of facets of the situation at the time that other that other writers couldn't really do from the perspective they were writing right. from. And just just, and so as a, started, just a, if I may, I'm, forgive me for interrupting you. I just want to make sure because you you mentioned another book. And I wanted to make sure the listeners were aware. Uh, Matter the what the book he's referring to, Matterhorn, uh, is uh, it's called Matterhorn, a, no a novel of the Vietnam War. It's by Carl Marlantes, and it was released. Uh, looks here, well, according to this, it was released in 2010. And um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there, uh, as you were saying, uh, there was very f there are very few novels of that time period that are really not from the American point of view. And, and I'm sorry, you were, you please continue. Well, the, the, the other thing, I, I took a gamble and, and started the story early where um, the main character was still in college, in college. And, this, and, and after the, um, the Tet Offensive 1968, and the Tet Offensive was a big, was a big turning point in the war. And when even yeah. Walter Cronkite came back from Vietnam and just, he was the most beloved TV commentator. Um. Gotcha. on the air at the time, and he just said, this war can't be won. So I took a gamble and started from the point of view of this character coming off a college campus where a lot of people were very violently against the war, and uh, this guy was much more ambivalent because he came from a, a family of pilots and, and who had been involved in World War II in, in an honorable way, and uh, so the, the character's more conflicted. But from a time when definitely the uh, the American public was turning against the war, and then he ends up landing in Southeast Asia, where there are guys heavenly involved, basically from the Air Force perspective, protecting the, the ground troops in the South. So I was able to really explore a lot of points of view. I call it looking at the full catastrophe. And the thing I've been amazed about is uh, consistently veterans have embrace this book. So even taking a gamble and in, in making the character a very reluctant warrior, the story's true enough that guys that were really there in all, you know, on the ground in Vietnam and Laos, guys that were flying from all kinds of different jobs over here, uh, some guys that were involved in radio intelligence and little bases and Laos, the whole group of them have really embraced this story. And that's in a very pleasant surprise. I didn't. I didn't know what I was putting out into the world, but uh, it's rung true for a lot of people. Well, I mean that's wonderful. I mean, especially if you have the uh, the praise of the veterans and all that. I mean, and for crying out loud, I mean, again, being nominated for that Kirkus Award, that in itself is validation and confirmation enough of of how great this work is. Now, can you give us a little bit of detail? I mean, the book itself is called The Big Buddha Bicycle Race, and I noticed that you mentioned The Big Buddha. Now, 
not everybody has been there. <laughs> I myself haven't. Maybe one day I'll go. I don't know. Can you get is is there such a thing as a real big Buddha bicycle race? And if not, what exactly? How does this race tie in to the actual story of the book itself? Well, there actually there is a big Buddha, and at the time we were stationed there forty years ago, it was the biggest Buddha image and, and one of the most revered sites in Ubon province. And at that time, 40 years ago, Ubon province was the largest province in Thailand. It's since, it's since actually been cut in half, and the town where the big Buddha is located is a different <laughs> province. But nevertheless, it was a, a beautiful image at the time, Sorry, a beautiful, you know, like a 30-foot tall statue of, of a sitting Buddha. And uh, when I went back and visited a couple years ago, what I was amazed to discover was um, there are bigger Buddha images now, gigantic things, but they're just not as revered as this one, because this one's old. It's been around 100 years. And what's been really wonderful to see is it's, it's, it's revered by the Thai people, and so it's more beautiful than it ever was. And, and uh, So if anyone ever does have a chance to visit Ubon, Thailand, which is not that hard to do these days because there's good air service out to Ubon, uh, to take a taxi out to the Big Buddha is really... It's really worth it. And what I've, what's been a real gold mine for me is there's a group called Ubon Vets, and these are guys like myself who were stationed at Ubon, about a thousand of them, and several of them have been back, like myself, have been back to the actual Big Buddha, and uh, posted pictures online. And it's, again, it's just kind of cool to see that not only was it a real, a real site at the time of the book, but it's, it's still there and it's still treasured by the Thai people and by any Americans that get a chance to go out there and take a look at it. Well, I mean, it's great to hear that it's still there. I mean, you know, you there was a little bit of, you know, every time you hear about things like this, you know, with all the destruction of things that have been going on and and um, the destruction of statues and not just here in the country. I'm not just talking about the ones here. I'm talking about everywhere in the world you hear about this happening. I, there's always that fear that somebody you know, defaced it or something. I mean, I know in Afghanistan they got rid of that ancient, um, the, the, yeah. I think it was ISIS or, or uh, Al-Qaeda got rid of that ancient um, sculpture up there. That was so horrible. And uh, so yeah, that was kind of a, to there. That was kind of a cultural clash where what had been a Buddhist country then right. was taken, you know, became, became an Islamic state and then became an extreme Islamic state where Northeast Thailand has been... Theravada Buddhist for a thousand years, and uh, so it's it's very uh, say you know it's very revered and respected here. The south of Thailand is a little more uh, diverse and and it, it might be more vulnerable. To, but in, in this part of Thailand, it's uh, it's in no jeopardy. Of, <laughs> it, 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 in fact, the opposite has happened. It's been beautified and and made more you know. More, for visitors that have a, even a more pleasant experience to go out there and spend a day. All right, yeah, I mean, talking about visitors, I hear it's pretty, I see, I hear how busy it is over where you are. And again, ladies and gentlemen, make, you know, please be aware, Terrence is talking to us from actually Thailand right now. He's in, uh, what's the name of the bar you're in? I'm in a wonderful place called the Writers Club and Wine Bar. Right. On uh, maybe the main tourist street in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It's a street called Raja Damnong, and it's between two of the main sites of tourists coming to Chiang Mai. The Tape Gate, which is like an old thousand-year-old gate that's been preserved, and oh, wow. uh, and then uh, Wat Pasing, which is one of the oldest Buddhist temples in Chiang Mai. So, and in, in this this street on Sundays becomes a walking market. So it's uh, a boom. <laughs> booming location that anybody, uh, any of your listeners uh, would have an easy time finding it if they ever get to Chiang Mai, and I highly recommend Chiang Mai and the Writers Club. That's great. Yeah, I mean, when you said Writers Club earlier, I thought you meant, oh, it's a place where you, you know, you go in there to meet other writers, but it's actually, I did, so now, it's actually called the Writers Club. I mean, I think that's wonderful. Now, um, so getting getting back to the book, Terrence. So I understand. I mean, I know part of this book, of course, is about the country itself. It's about the you know the, the conflicts that happened there and everything. But I know there's also a love story. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What exactly 
how does this character, uh, Brendan Leary, uh, is, is the character, how does he exactly find love in this uh, atmosphere? And how does, I mean, how, I mean, without spoiling too much, obviously, because I want people to read the book. But how did you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the love story that and how it connects to the race itself? Yeah, well, it ends up connecting very much because several of the, of the main characters, well, all, many of the main characters were involved in the race from different perspectives. But in terms of the love story, it, um, it was something that I observed when I was here many years ago. And then as time has gone by and I've lived in Thailand and learned about Thai culture, uh, it isn't all that unusual. But it was uh, a beautiful Thai woman that was hanging around our group of friends that I, you know, I fictionalized. But uh, as time went on, over, you know, the year I spent there, what I learned about her as the year went on was that uh, she was actually married to an American who was now stationed in Korea. But when I met her, she had a, an American boyfriend. <laughs> and, they were, and they were talking about being engaged. And then she kind of got in, involved with a, another friend of mine at the same time. So she was juggling three men in her life. Well, as I've come back here, that's actually a skill that several Thai women are pretty good at. They might have a boyfriend in Germany and another boyfriend in Australia <laughs> and even have a Thai husband. Latin and, women also have that skill, by the way. I just want to interject that Latin women also yeah, do that. <laughs> true. They, they just, actually, what's interesting is they used to do it with letters, and, and they would have to have someone, you know, translate their tie into English, and, and I was around some of this translations getting done, and that was hilarious, because sometimes the translator wouldn't get it, get it right, and I'd have to kind of fix up the letters for some of my female Thai friends, but now with the internet, uh, it's really become, they become much, even more skillful at it, but as you say, uh, there are plenty of people that are pretty good at playing the internet <laughs> <laughs> love affairs. So anyway, uh, the thing that really surprised me was uh, my publisher, Silkworm Books, here in Chiang Mai, has has one real masterpiece they've turned out through the years. It's called uh, the story of Kun Chang Kun Tan, and it's a it's a classic. It was originally a a poem that became a play that then was written into a novel. But it's just a piece of classic Thai literature, and in this story, the uh, one main character is, is a warrior who is uh, marries this lovely Thai woman, and, but he's somehow by being a warrior, he's allowed to collect a few other wives as he wins back. He actually went from the capital of Udi to Chiang Mai, when Chiang Mai was a different country, and brings back a, a war bride. So somehow, in, cult in the culture of that time, it was okay for the men to collect a few brides, but the um, the central female character in that novel uh, had real problems because she couldn't decide between a rich Thai husband and this warrior husband who was away a lot, and she ended up coming to a tragic end. So anyway, what I learned from that was that what I was observing in Ubon 40 years ago was not new. <laughs> uh, and it's sort of, in a way, it's Thailand's guilty secret because what I'd had the book under my arm when I'd go to immigration, and some of the secretaries at Thai immigration would kind of say, "Oh, you're reading, you're reading that book." Like I was um, kind of getting some privileged information, but it's a very, inter very interesting culture here. That's great, and you know, a, another major part of this is also, of course, your experiences and and whatnot. Now, um, I, you know, in, in reading about you, I find that you have a very, very, uh, uh, pretty diverse resume here in, in the entertainment industry. And, you know, not many people can say that they've, you know, worked for, um, Goodbye Girl and Quincy designing women, Seinfeld, which I would love, by the way, before we end this, I want to speak with you about that. But more, more akin or more specific to to this book is Mash, and I would really like for to speak with you about that. Now, how long did you work on the Mash set as cameraman? Or is it? Yeah. Well, I. It's funny. Uh, 
when we were, I think stationed in Ublon was when the movie came out, and a lot of GIs just loved that movie because it was sort of, it expressed the kind of defying authority, and the guys, because they were doctors, could get away with it. Well, in a way, by being on a photo unit several parts of the world, we could do that too because we were turned loose. You know, we were off on small units on our own and could kind of exert our own personalities. So I connected with, you know, I could connect with it. But I loved the movie so much that the first several years the TV show was on, I refused to watch it because I refused to believe that a TV show could be as good as the movie. And then finally, right. I started watching it and really loved it. And by about the third season, at that point, I'd gotten into an apprenticeship program in the camera union. They were opening up, to, they were opening up the union to people in film schools like myself. And uh, and one of the shows I worked on was Mash. And uh, there was a camera at the time was Bill Jorgensen, and he really impressed because he was, in the way they they did the show, they were. They were doing it like a feature film. They were doing it with one camera, not right. three, even though it was a half hour comedy. And they just did things experimental. They do an episode where the whole episode was from the point of view of somebody in a wheelchair, you know, and, and just. Oh, I from, remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so they they did. You know, I just really admired that they would do some experimental things like that, and just the way they edited the film. It was much more like a feature than like a TV show. And then by the fifth year, uh, I had a an offer to come work on it full time, which I did, and and then uh, for the last four seasons, I pretty much came, whenever they had an extra camera, I got called in. I, I was a second assistant when I worked on it full time, and then as I moved up to first assistant, oh wow, a little more involved pulling focus and a little a little bit artistic part of being a technician. Uh, Pretty much any time they were they were out at the ranch um, doing locations, I, w I was out there, and then I was really happy to be heavily involved on the very last episode. And uh, oh wow, wow! One, That's... one thing that was really cool, we we were using the original sets, the the uh, a lot of the you know stuff inside the operating room and in their in the swamp. At, was it 20th Century Fox in the studios? And that was the original set from the movie and then we got to the Fox Ranch and all the exterior locations were for the movie. So there's just something pretty cool about that. That that is cool. And, so And it really you know, it really um, it was one show that I actually did write some spec scripts for, but there was enough of a pecking order in Hollywood that I never had the guts to submit them until the last season. And by the last season they had already assigned all the they assigned all the writers for the year. But at least I got into that kind of writing and that kind of voice, and that's something that the uh, the, the reviewer at Turkish Magazine picked up on. There was kind of a mash feeling, and several of my friends through the years uh, were picking up on you know that that, that show somehow got into my head, <laughs> affected my writing in a good way. I think. Well, I mean that's great, and and how um, I've heard many people that have been interviewed about this show say this. Uh, discussed this before but i'm curious how how close i mean within editing standards and within censoring standards of course but how you know close to the actual goings on of that war was this uh area done you know how do you feel do you feel that it was shown in a good light in a realistic light or do you feel it was saccharined in any way well the the thing uh, I remember at the time, the, the general commentary among my friends and just what I was reading in the media was that it was it was set in Korea, but it was really about Vietnam. And so, and look, I've just actually been picking up some uh, some CDs of the later seasons at a swap meet here in Chiang Mai, and looking at them again. And uh, the thing I give it a lot of credit for is. Uh, there was like an episode where they lost a patient, and they lost a lot of patients. So that was very realistic. These weren't gods that, you know, like, these weren't like Ben Casey where every story had a happy ending at all. Right, and, right. Uh, and the operating room, there was def you know, there was blood flowing, and it, it was as messy as a real operating room. And where they, uh, 
the huge difference was, I mean, I was involved with combat units, and the language was very salty. Even in my books, pretty salty, and I used interview material, you know, that I would develop into my story, and I would cut out 10% of the salty language, and it still turned out pretty salty. Uh, but I think with dealing with doctors, it still rang pretty true that they wouldn't be uh, using the kind of language that combat crews would be using. So, uh, yeah, it's a little saccharine, maybe it's a little bit cutesy, but the overall feeling was pretty pretty true to life. That, uh, that's great. I mean, and obviously you enjoyed working on that and doing that afforded you the opportunity to go on and work on all these other great shows. And, um, you know, but before we, we wrap up here, what, what am, I, I've got to ask you, cause I'm a major fan. What, how, how did you get on Seinfeld and how, how long did you work in that one? Well, there was a case where like a lot of my friends, we went to Hollywood to make feature films and then realistically, Primetime TV was our was our bread and butter, and it was really uh, the Cosby Show. It was so successful that it uh, it changed the industry, and and for several years it just really switched heavily to uh, to sitcoms. And so a lot of sitcoms came along, and uh, a good friend of mine got me into sitcoms, and I you know, did things like Designing Women and some other shows that didn't last so so long, but just out of being on a crew that worked a lot, we uh, we were called and we did the, the pilot in the first season of Seinfeld, and then I did a second season, and then, like a lot of times, we, we move on to other projects, but to just be on the first couple of seasons was, yeah, I really knew it was something special. It, it just uh, the cast just for had, what? The, yeah, you just had that feeling. I mean, did, did you ever meet any of the cast in person, like Jerry Seinfeld or um, well, you know, I want to jump back to MASH because, real quickly because sure, one sure, thing sure. I loved about MASH is when we were out at the ranch, the crew was really down to earth. And it was one case where uh, the, the cast and the crew and the cast just ate together out, out on location. So that, that was part of what made MASH so special. They were just a real, it really was kind of a family. On Seinfeld, you know, we, that was all in the studio, so the, the actors kind of stayed off to themselves. But still, it was a very relaxed set. And I had already been a fan of Louise Dreyfus. She had done a, another series right before that where she was just terrific. And to see her go on and now, and she's won like her fifth or sixth Emmy for another yeah. show, uh, she was definitely a, re a reason I was attracted. And I like Seinfeld. He had been on Johnny Carson back when Johnny Carson was the main oh, attraction. Wow, yeah. and, and so I kind of had a hunch it was going to be something special just from knowing those two. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's iconic. It really, I mean, it's up there with, with you know, forgive me, if, but I think it's up there with I Love Lucy and 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 well, and Mash too. Even though it's a different, it's drama. Well, it had comedy too, but you know, they're both very legendary shows. You know, and it's just amazing that not many people can say that they've worked on two legendary shows like that. So you know, major yeah. kudos to you, Terrence. Yeah, I really was looking back. I just somehow. Uh, I don't know if management just kind of the, the people in production offices knew I would fit well on certain shows, but to avoid even Quincy, I've had several doctors through the years tell me they became doctors from watching Quincy. Yeah. And, and so to be part of that show that really, a lot of integrity. We actually had a real uh, lab tech from the corners, LA coroner's office as a regular character on the show, but he was also our technical <laughs> advisor. How about so, that? And, and from here to eternity, the miniseries, it, it, I mean, I'm in awe of the of the feature film with Montgomery Clift and Frank right. Sinatra. But for a miniseries with uh, William Devane doing his first big TV production, I had seen him in, in theater around L.A. and thought he was awesome. And to have Natalie Wood making her comeback, that, that was an incredible experience. So I was really, for making my bread and butter in, in television, I, I got to work with, you know, like you said, some legendary people. I even worked on Lucille Ball's very last series, which was not so successful. What? But a lot of, a lot of her same writers and the, the camera coordinator were people that went back to her, back her, you know, to her peak years. So that that, that was. Uh, are you, know, you was talking about week. the Are you talking about the Lucy show? This, this I think this was just, you know, 
you work on so many, the names start blurring right. together. It might just be, no, it might just be called Lucy. It, it, yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. Okay, I think I know which one thing, you're talking about. Yeah. The thing I remember on that show because it it only stayed, it might not have even stayed on a full season or at most one season, but right. uh, she brought in John Ritter as a guest star, and I actually I happen to have known John Ritter from film school because he was a buddy of a of a directing friend of mine and. I knew John Ritter when he was such a cool guy. He would come in and he would just hold light. He would hang, sit on the on the hood of a car and hold the lights for us to help us get a, a night scene on on, on Fairfax Boulevard. So he was just a, he was a real down to earth guy. So but I've heard. Yeah, she loved him, and to have him as a guest star, just to see Lucy love this young up and coming actor, that was that was a really cool experience. That's great. That's wow! What a resume. I mean, what a that's unbelievable. I mean, wow, I'm a little bit speechless here. Now, so getting back to this book, so you've got The Big Buddha Bicycle Race. Now, am I to understand there's already a sequel? It's called The Year. There is. You know, there's one little one little piece I want to get in to the, to the first book. Uh, the Duke of Da character is pretty much based on a real, on this, on this real beautiful woman that had all these love interests. The thing I changed was making my main character part of her, part of her entourage of, of boyfriends, and this guy being a, a, a northeast kind of a northeastern snob, he he thought he could straighten her out. So that kind of adds some tragedy and comedy to the story. That he that he's the guy that thinks he's going to turn her into a straight ahead, <laughs> nakedness woman, and and. Uh, doesn't quite work out according to plan. Oh boy! So, yeah, now, but yeah. she, but she's in this next one though. She's, I think it's called the, the Year of the Rabbit, right? I mean, she's yes. in this one. So, I mean, did you already finish this one? Is it already out, or, or can you tell us a little bit more about it? It's, it's, um, it's pretty much written. I need to do a little bit of polishing, but uh, that's the pretty exciting bit of news that's come up since we've been in touch. Is that uh, Ohio University Press is is picking the book up for the first book, Big Buddha, for American, English, and European distribution starting February. So it's actually going to be in bookstores. And uh, and they want the second book. So uh, that should be out. The second book should be out by the end of 2018, maybe early 2019. Well, and there was... the, right. And, and But the, the, the Big Buddha Bicycle Race, people can get it digitally now i mean in a smart what about the paper hardcover is it isn't it already available or it's, or it's it available in in print and as an ebook at amazon and anybody that happens to be in southeast asia can also get it it's in bookstores in thailand laos and cambodia the the print edition and also from silkworms uh, website if they happen to be right. in southeast asia that's that's fantastic wow i just Congratulations, Terrence. This is what. So I'll keep you what, filled in because what, who knows if yeah, this is actually do. become the hardcover book. I, I couldn't be happier, but just to see it in print is pretty gratifying. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I mean, I'm an author myself, and and I've had one of my books published uh, by a major publisher uh, about a year ago, and I mean, I, it's, I mean, nowhere near as as a as award worthy as yours by any stretch of the imagination. But I remember how excited it was to see it come out and, and, and I just, yeah. you know, can't even begin to imagine how happy you must be. And, and, you, mu and you should be. I mean, this is one hell of a story, and it definitely should be told from this perspective. And um, I, I just, I wish you all the happiness in the world, my friend. Can you, uh, before we leave, can you give a little bit of advice? Because we have a lot of writers that... Uh, listen to the show and watch the show and they often ask me how they can get it how they can get make be successful and get found or or discovered and can you get do you have any advice for like you know aspiring writers out there of, of any genre screenwriting novel writing anything that you could uh impart yeah i kind of do because i think in a way it's it was analogous to breaking into the film into the film industry that was impossible and somehow, me and a couple of my friends did it. And then what I, the one thing I picked up that year I was in, in an apprenticeship program, which was a new way to get in to the camera union, was uh, everybody got in a different way. And I remember in, 
at USC, a very charismatic production executive talking about how, man, if you get a job in the in, in the mailroom, take it. And and uh, so that was the way you did it in the film. You took any opportunity you could and you learned right, and, right, and, and right. tried to go from there. With writing, what I've seen is uh, e-books are now a respectable way to to put your work out. And there are some pretty competent agents that are looking through e-books. Kirkus Magazine will... Uh, We'll look at e we'll look at ebooks and and give them a good shot and and so that's a way to go that I I, I try to avoid personally but now I've seen that's it's an okay way to go I think the main thing is to uh, believe in what you're writing in believe in what you're writing and uh, some people can write in a genre I kind of can't I could for a TV series if I was working on it, but but uh, if you can write for a, write in a genre, do it and get a you know a sense of what the parameters are. Uh, for for new books these days, what I've learned is uh, they want things uh, kind of around ninety thousand words, two hundred thousand words, and your and computers will give you a word count. And so that's something just to just have in the back of your head to have something that's going to get read because the way a lot of Publishers and uh, literary agents work is uh, they have they have some they have an assistant working for them and they see a word count, 150,000 words, it goes in the trash without it being looked at. So if you're just starting out, you know try to work in the parameters of, of what your genre is. And if you're doing something like what I've done, which is more literary fiction, just really believe in what you're doing and, and do your homework and just put your heart and soul into it and uh, and keep looking. Great. Keep and what, looking because there might be a big publisher in New York that'll. It's the right time and the right place. But there are also a lot of independent publishers, and that you can find those uh, on the internet. You know, Canadian publishers that'll that'll take a chance on more experimental things. Right. And then in my case, uh, university publishers. I'm sorry, I've been dealing with an independent publisher here in Chiang Mai, and now a university publisher. So those are all ways to get your books out and just keep your antennas out and go to yep. writing conferences also and, and, and meet some agents in person and publishers in person. That's something also. Well, that's a good, uh, that, that's, that, yeah, that's a good point. What about self-publishing? Do you, um, what are your thoughts on self-publishing? Well, it's just, uh, I, w I went to the Writer's Digest convention in New York two summers ago, and that was the theme that uh, there's a whole gamut of, of ways to publish now from traditional to completely independent. And now there's something called hybrid, which are more it's kind of like a co-op and maybe different writers who have certain skills would help edit or proofread or whatever other book within the, within the, uh, the hybrid publishing house. So um, there's a lot of opportunities. There's also a huge amount of books getting published, so it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> That's but true. That's definitely, true. an ebook is you know a self-published ebook is a respectable way to go now. If you, uh, the thing I have seen from a few friends of mine that have self-published was wishing, in hindsight, they had hired an editor to to really go over it. And I yes, would add to that a copy yes. editor, because in the traditional publishing, you do have an in-house editor that works with it and an in-house copy editor, and those are two different skills. And But there are freelance people that will do that. So yep. Very true. To wow. have the discipline in self-publishing, to put, put it through those to put it through those two steps uh, would, would really give a much better shot of succeeding. Wonderful. Thank you so and much, And a last Aaron, thought, really. one yes, last please. thought is... Be prepared to um, find a publicist also. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, uh, good piece of advice. It was that's just true. a surprise, but it's it's been true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely need a uh, you're definitely uh, somebody that you know um, uh, you're big enough that you, you yeah a publicist would be great. And uh, but you know what with a, with a book like this, I mean it in itself. Is, is definitely getting your name out there, um, and 
I, for one, enjoyed this book uh, from you know what I saw, and um, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you guys haven't gotten this book yet, get it. You don't have to be in to the Vietnam War or any of that just to be able to read it. It's a great story, um, and it really speaks to to you as a person, you know. And and you know you can really connect with this character, with this lead character, because this, this lead character can be any of us. And so I highly recommend this, The Big Buddha Bicycle Race uh, by Terrence A. Harkin. That's T-E-R-E-N-C-E-A-H-A is the middle initial, and H-A-R-K-I-N. And you can pick up this book in most major bookstores or online on Amazon.com. It's, again, The Big Buddha Bicycle Race. Terrence, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us um, all the way from Thailand and uh you know, we want to. We hope we can get you on again, and let us know when the other book's coming out, and and uh, you know, just uh, maybe spread the word about the show over there. It would be nice. We already have some fans in Sweden, so it would be nice to have some fans in in in, in Asia too. That would be nice. We'll do, Emilio. And I, one thing I have done is build up a fairly substantial Facebook following, so there'll be five thousand people getting to know about the show. <laughs> when I put That's a, great. I'll put a little blurb up tonight. I appreciate that. So, guys, uh, I really so enjoyed talking you, to you, Amelia. Yeah, it was it was a pleasure speaking with you, Terrence. You have a great day, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Have a